It's a real joy and privilege tonight to launch a new series where we're going to be dipping into the book of Acts and the amazing stories of the early church. And our title for this new series is Church on Fire. And we're going to be looking at tonight the birth of the early church on the day of Pentecost. We're going to be considering what it looks like on a community when the Spirit comes in power. What does it mean to be a community on fire? Now, the other week, about a month ago, um, I was driving around Oxford and I kept seeing the same van everywhere I went. It was the same kind of van slogan that was written on the side of it. And the, the slogan written on the side of it was, Church's Fire. Church's Fire. And it got to the point where even outside work on, on Pembroke Street, I saw the same van parked up. And it was about the fourth time in the one day that I'd seen the same van everywhere. Church's Fire. Now, God speaks to us in lots of different ways, mainly speaks through his word, but we hear him in all different different ways. And sometimes it's through the things we see around us. And I'm a bit slow on the uptake at times, but finally after seeing this van so many times, I started thinking, oh yeah, church on fire. So I just prayed a little quick prayer. Yes, Lord, set your church on fire. And I didn't think much more about it. But then as I was preparing for this talk and thinking a little bit more about what it is to be a church on fire. I was reminded of seeing those vans all around the city. And I thought, well, I'll just look up this company and see what it's all about. And um, turns out Church's Fire is uh, doing amazing work in leading fire and safety security around the UK. So shout out to Church's Fire um, for preventing church fire and theft. Um, But last week, Stephen was preaching on the last few verses of that beautiful prayer, the words that Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil and lead us not into temptation, reminding us of the power of prayer in the midst of the battle that we face in the world around us today. And you know what? So often, the enemy will try and rob us, will try and prevent us from remembering who we have been called to be, a people called out of darkness into light, a people set free, the redeemed family of God, a church on fire, a church triumphant, a people who Jesus is coming back for, a people who are called to be set on fire. But because of Jesus' life, death and resurrection, his ascension into heaven and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on that day of Pentecost, the birthday of the church, no matter how much the enemy seeks to prevent the fire of the church from spreading, or however much we, in our brokenness, seem to try and mess up the church. Globally, all around the world today, the church is still on fire. It's a community set ablaze with the love of God, called to be clothed with power from on high, filled with the Holy Spirit. So let me begin in prayer tonight by praying some words of a great preacher that Tozer said. He prayed this. O God, who is a consuming fire, burn deep within our heart and soul, that we may know you as you are worthy to be known. Amen. Amen. So what, as we look at the day of Pentecost, can we learn about what it means to be a community on fire, to be a community of people who the Holy Spirit has come upon? Well, I've got three simple points for us tonight, and easy for us to remember, a little bit old school. We're going to go with earth, wind, and fire. I'm going to start with wind, though, so just to reverse the order a little bit. So beginning with wind. So chapter two, if you've got your Bibles, keep them open, and we're going to journey through those verses together. So first one, we read that on the day of Pentecost, when they were all together in one place, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, and the whole house was filled where they were sitting. So we're looking at wind. So the first phenomenon that they experienced as they were gathered together, the believers waiting for this promised Holy Spirit, was the sound of a violent wind blowing upon them that came from heaven. Now, I know us Brits like to talk about the weather a fair amount, but if you've ever been in a storm, if you've ever experienced violent wind, this is not just a kind of soft breeze on your face. This can be a pretty terrifying thing. I was thinking back to when I've experienced the force of wind, and it was back when I was climbing a mountain with my sister on top of the old man of Coniston. Has anyone been up there? Maybe one or two, see if you And um, It can get really windy up there. And I remember it was so windy, my poor sister, I'd already dragged her up there. She was kind of curled up in the fetal position, like, this doesn't feel safe. When the wind is blowing, you know about it. It can be pretty terrifying. But what was so significant about the Spirit coming upon the believers gathered in that place, waiting on God, is that they experienced something from outside of themselves, a power from on high coming down upon them. And they all experienced it. 
And you know, in the Old Testament, as we journey through the story of the people of God, the Holy Spirit would come upon a particular person or particular people at an appointed time, but there was this growing expectation that one day the Spirit would be poured out on all people, that God would visit them in power. So on the day of Pentecost, we first see it as a sovereign act of God, of him fulfilling his promise. To be a spirit-filled church is to be a people in whom the Spirit of God has come down upon, that God has entered the building. You know, so much of our culture today is about looking within, about being true to ourselves, about finding our hopes and dreams by looking inside and in all of ourselves. The self-help book market is a huge, huge, huge market, and some of the popular titles at the moment, um, a recent number one Sunday Times bestseller has the title of this, How to Overcome Challenges and Take Control of Your Career. Another book, um, The Good Life, How Self-Love is the Key to Unlocking Your Greatness. Another one, I can't say the beginning bit of the title in church, but it goes, the next bit says, How to Stop Doubting Your Greatness and Live an Awesome Life. This one I think is actually could be a bit good. It says, if in doubt, wash your hair. A manual for life. So I don't know what advice that's got in it. But not to knock this, this whole market, you know, this truth to be found in this positivity. But you know, however many life hacks we try or even disciplined routine or ideologies that we try and follow, they can never ultimately lead us to freedom and life. And I think sometimes this can even creep into the church into our Christian life, thinking that we can actually do church without God, try and do things in our own strength or with our own strategies and plans. But to be a follower of Jesus is to actually say that the problems we face, they come from within, from the brokenness of our sin, that we need something, someone from outside. We need a savior, we need power from on high, we need God in order to live out the Christian life. We're not called to offer people religion, but to offer them life. And the only self-help we actually need is to die to ourselves and to live for Christ. And that's what's so beautiful about being the church. It's to be a community of sinners saved by grace, people who have been given undeserved radical grace and love. We can't do church Without God, we need the fresh wind of his spirit to continually blow in and through us and upon us. But it's an incredibly freeing thing that we don't need to do this in our own strength. We don't need to strive to be the church. That we wait on God and we come to him for his life-giving spirit and his power. But on the day of Pentecost, we don't just see the wind of God, the wind of the spirit bringing um, an external experience upon the people of God. We also see an internal transformation that came upon this people. So second up, fire. They, verse three, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came and rest, rested on, upon each and every one of them. Again, like wind, fire is symbolic of God's power, his dynamism, of his life. And as you'll know, all throughout the scriptures, fire represents God's presence, his holiness, it represents that he is there with his people. When God made his covenant with Abraham, there was fire. When he spoke to Moses from the burning bush, it was through the fire, representing the holiness of his presence. Now, the festival of Pentecost in the Jewish calendar, it was a festival of the harvest, but it was also 50 days after Passover, remembering when God delivered his people, the Israelites, out of captivity in, in Egypt. And when we look back in scripture into the Old Testament, and we actually see what's considered to be the first Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, when the Israelite people were gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai and God entered into a covenant relationship with them where they were to be set apart from, for him. He invited Moses, his appointed man for the job, his prophet, up onto the mountain and gave him the Ten Commandments to deliver to the people the law. And you can read about it in Exodus chapter 19, verse 18, where it says that God came down and there was fire and the mountain trembled. Now there are many similarities between what we read in that early, that first, if you like, past, uh, Pentecost day to this, what we read about in Acts. Both times God came down in fire, there was wind, and there was a message being proclaimed. But there were also some huge differences. On Mount Sinai, only Moses could go into the holy place before the Lord and stand before God. The people couldn't come near the fire. There was fear that it would destroy them. And this is what is so incredible about the day of Pentecost, that the fire 
was resting on every single person, that each person became, if you like, a burning bush for the Lord. And Moses was an amazing man, but Jesus was even greater. Fully God, fully man, the only one who could mediate between us and God. He didn't just come to pray for us, to give a message. He came to die for us, to te- take away the separation between us and God so that we can enter into the Holy Holies. We can come before his holy presence. I love the way the message translation speaks of this. It says, how, you ask? Well, it says, in Christ, God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so that we could be put right with God, so that we could be put right with God. The fire of the Spirit resting on every single believer. And so what what does that actually mean? What does that change for us today? Well, it means that what was prophesied in Ezekiel, that the Spirit would come and take our hearts of stone, and give us hearts of flesh, that the word of the Lord would be written on our hearts. It means that we can know in the very depths of our being, each and every one of us can know intimacy and nearness with God. When the fire came upon the church, it brought about a new intimacy and security that each and every one of them would know what it was to be a son or daughter of the Most High God. The Holy Spirit poured the love of God into their hearts. If you like, taking what they knew in their minds and burning it into their hearts. So to be a Christian is to have the Spirit of God living inside you, is to be able to say that Jesus is Lord by the power of the Spirit. But it's also to know in a greater experience and awareness the love of God, our identity and security as beloved sons and daughters. I love the way Tim, the late Tim Keller puts it like this in his book Prayer on Prayer called Experiencing Awe and Intimacy with God. He describes an illustration where one day he saw a father and son walking along the street and suddenly the father swept up the son into his arms and held the son and told the boy that he loved him and after a few minutes he put the boy back down. And the question he poses is, was this little boy more, uh, more a son in the father's arms than when he was just walking next to him on the street? Well, in one sense, objectively and legally, there was absolutely no difference. This boy was still a son. But actually, subjectively and experientially, there was all the difference in the world. In his father's arms, the boy was experiencing sonship, held, knowing that he was loved. You know, there are many incredible parents out there. I am swiftly beginning to appreciate and grow in expectancy for what each of you do. This is not just a big roast dinner. (laughs) We are expecting a baby. But the reality is, um, even the best parents in the world get it wrong. And there may be some here tonight who have had little or no relationship with your earthly family and parents. But what I want to say tonight is don't let those wounds that have been caused to you, even though they're very real, prevent you from opening yourself up to the love of the Father, to the everlasting arms that he longs to embrace you in tonight. Because when you know that you are loved by God, when the fire of the Holy Spirit comes and brings that assurance, that intimacy, that Jesus died for you, that he loves you, that he sees you, that he knows you, that he died to rescue you and bring you back, it changes everything. You know, when I became a Christian, I've described this story many times here, but when I encountered the Holy Spirit in a deep and experiential way, it really did feel quite tangibly like the Father's arms were around me. And I love hearing many different people's stories and experiences of how they've experienced God. And we'd love to pray for you to experience more of him tonight. But there's also just a sweetness in the kind of everyday mundane, um, when we make time for God, when we, we look to him, when we just call out to him where we begin to cultivate an intimacy and a secret history with him, where he burns that fire of his love into our hearts. And as we were praying earlier, Zen prayed that maybe we could pray that this summer would be a summer that our hearts would grow in love for Jesus, that our hearts would burn with love for him again. Because we see the impact on this group when that fire brought something new into their hearts. It didn't just bring about this intimacy with God, it also transformed them with a new anointing and boldness and joy to proclaim truth. The tongues of fire that rested upon them set their tongues ablaze to proclaim the wonders of God. And we read, as, it, as it's described, something extraordinary was going on, that people were looking on at, at this group of people that seemed to be transformed and thought they were drunk. In verse 13, some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. I've often wondered what they must have looked like for people to be saying this about them. 
And some of you may or may not be aware, but they're sort of different phases, I think, of drunkenness that we can observe in people around us. And, you know, perhaps sometimes there's that sort of happy window of like a happy drunk. There's some kind of merriment and freedom and, and what comes across as kind of joy, um, which often or not, depending on how much a person is drunk, doesn't last that long before it tips into either them just kind of passing out or getting a little bit angry or, you know, not, in not being in a good state. So I wonder kind of what was going on that these guys looked on this group of people and thought they must be drunk. Well, we know that Jesus is no fun sponge, and you know, his, war- his first miracle was turning water into wine, and, and I believe that in heaven we're going to enjoy lovely, fine wine. But the Bible is pretty clear. It says in Ephesians, do not be drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And actually, you know, if you're any kind of medical profession here tonight, you'll know that ultimately alcohol is actually a depressant, that it depresses our nervous system and essentially reduces our ability to think clearly that actually that kind of happiness window is really just numbing reality. But yet something was going on in these people that they were experiencing a new reality, a joyful freedom that was bubbling over in each of them. I don't think they were less aware of what was going on. They were actually more aware of what was happening, of seeing who they were called to be and of wanting to overflow with that love into the world around them, an uninhibited, joyful proclamation of the gospel. And this is a mark of the fire of God inside of someone. A friend once described someone who loves to share their faith to me like this. He said, they're like a a full glass of champagne. That when you bump into them a bit like a toast, they just bubble over. They can't help but bubble over with life and share the love of Christ. And maybe you've been drawn here tonight because you have a friend that there is just something different about them. There is a kind of bubbling over. Um, They might not be the biggest extrovert in the world, but there's just something different about them, or perhaps it was that person that sparked your kind of interest or journey into faith. That certainly happened for me when I was at university. I had a friend, the only Christian I knew, and she would come on nights out with us, and this is before I became a Christian, and she wouldn't necessarily drink anything, but yet she just seemed to have this kind of peace and joy about her. And I looked back and I asked her, like, oh, how did you find coming out with us? And me and my friends said it was so difficult, but I knew that God had called me to be around you, and because she didn't judge us, she just was around us. When she invited me to church, I thought, you know what, I'll come along with you, and I'm so grateful that she did. And whether or not you feel like a bubbling over glass of champagne or more like a flat Coke, um, the Spirit of God always points us to Jesus, and he longs to renew and refresh and pour his love, the love of his Spirit, into us each day. And so let us pray that we would have that same boldness, that anointing, that joyful freedom to speak of Christ wherever he calls us to be, to set our tongues on fire. Which brings me finally to earth. Now, the day of Pentecost, it was both the fulfillment of a promise, the completion of Christ's saving work and the coming of the Holy Spirit, but it was also the commencement of something new that was gonna spread all over the earth, the church. And Christ's, Christ's work is continuing all around the world today because of what happened on this day. You know, Jesus may not be physically with us, walking among us as he was over 2,000 years ago, but by his spirit, his work is continuing through the body of Christ. And what was incredible though about that day, not just the phenomena of the wind and the fire, but also that every single nation was brought into the family of God. We read that people were heard speaking in other tongues, in other languages, if you like, that they would have never been able to speak before. But yet, in the midst of all these different languages being spoken, people were utterly amazed that they could all understand what was being said, but also how amazing at what was actually being said. They were declaring the wonders of God. And I think how beautiful it is that the proclamation of the gospel and the wonders of who Jesus really is was proclaimed in many, many different languages all at once. When the gospel was first preached to the world, it was preached in many different languages. And this is one of the things I love most about the church. Yes, we have got this so wrong at times, and there are many dark times in church history where we must repent and seek God's justice for those who have been wronged. But the truth is, not any one language or one culture or one nation can make a claim on Christianity. The church is wonderfully diverse. It's a multi-ethnic community. And that's actually always a sign that the Spirit of God is resting on a people when we see people brought together in unity in the midst of diversity. 
I remember the first time after um, becoming a Christian, worshipping in another nation. I was in um, South Africa, and my mind just being completely blown that the same God that I experienced here in Oxford was there in South Africa. I just couldn't get my head around it. That even though we were singing in a different language, and I was trying to sing along, not really very well, but I was still experiencing the same presence of God with brothers and sisters in South Africa. And it still blows my mind today whenever we worship in other languages or whether you ever you get to experience the joy of worshiping in other nations. But the wonderful thing about Oxford is it's a global city. We get blessed by the richness of people from all over the world coming to work and study and do life here. And we're so blessed by the richness of this diversity. We have written on the doors in the entrance to our foyer here that Jesus' words, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And we pray that if you are here tonight and you're from another nation, if yeah, you've come from somewhere else, we pray that this would feel like home to you. You would know that you're deeply valued and loved and a treasured part of this community. And it's because of you that we can taste something of the beauty of the worship of heaven of the nations gathered around the throne of Jesus, worshiping together. Even just a couple of weeks ago, I met a student from another part of the world where it's not easy to be a Christian. And she came along and then she joined a a little Bible study group. And she brought along two friends who had never been to church before, never had the opportunity to go. And they were so touched by what they experienced. One of them took a Bible away. We have an amazing opportunity as the nations gather in our city to share the love of Jesus with people who might not get the opportunity to hear of him where they are in the world today. And there's a beautiful line in a poem that speaks about the Holy Spirit by Gerard Manley Hopkins that says, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. And so may we pray that the grandeur and beauty of the fire of God would continue to fill the earth today. Because it wasn't just people from every nation that were praising God together, as Peter goes on to explain as he quotes Joel the prophet. We read that actually as well as the fulfillment of people from different nations coming together, we also read that the Holy Spirit was to be poured out on all types of people. In verse 17, um, it says, on your sons and daughters will prophesy. See, the outpouring of the Spirit on the church, it wasn't sexist. Both sons and daughters, male and female, men and women were there. Even earlier in chapter one, we read that as they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers, that men and women side by side, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them and they began to proclaim and testify to the goodness of God. We also read um, that the outpouring of the Spirit on the church wasn't ageist. There was both young men and old men will see visions and dream dreams, that both young and old have a part to play in building God's kingdom together. And the outpouring of the spirit on the church also wasn't elitist. We read that male and female servants will be part of it. It will be poured out upon them. All parts of society get to play a role in building God's church. In fact, So much of Jesus' ministry, he spent time with the outcasts and the marginalized of society. He was drawn to them in the most beautiful way. This is the beauty of the church. Because as we read in verse 21, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Not just the theologically educated or the ones who've got their lives together, but everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is what the spirit of God being poured out upon the church means for us today, means to be a church on fire. And I really believe the Lord wants to draw each of us into a deeper revelation of what it is, not just as individuals, but as the body of Christ, as the church we've been called to be, to be captivated by his love, to experience a fresh wind, to experience the fire of God in our hearts, to know the role that we've been called to play in being part of his church. And it might be for some today just joining in more here at St. Aldates, perhaps joining a team, joining a small group, or even just committing to coming along more regularly. Perhaps you've been coming for a while and just sort of sitting on the edge. We want to welcome you in and draw you, call you to be part of this church family. But perhaps there are also some here tonight who feel called to go further afield, feel called to take the gospel to different places or different people groups. And we pray that that you would know the anointing and the equipping and the boldness of Jesus, wherever he has called you to be. So can I invite the band to come up? We're going to draw to a close in just a moment. But just finally, 
had the joy of um, being at two weddings over the weekend. It was quite a lot, two, one on Friday and one on Saturday. And um, wedding ceremonies are a beautiful, symbolic um, picture of lives being joined together, of love and commitment before God, of people entering into the covenant of marriage. But weddings also point us to something bigger, something even more beautiful, that no matter our relationship status, whether we're single or in a relationship, we're all invited to as the people of God to be part of. Because the Bible speaks of one day Jesus returning for his bride, that we as the people of God are the bride of Christ. And that can feel a little bit strange to get your head around, but it's a beautiful image of his commitment and of his love towards each and every one of us. And whether or not you've had a good experience of church or whether or not you've been struggling with your experience of church, don't let that earthly kind of experience taint what you're called to be part of. Because he's calling us to be made ready to be a prepared bride, to be a people who are captivated by his love. And actually, um, a few months ago, I remember just being in worship, and sometimes, you know, God, God speaks in different ways. I just had this kind of image come into my mind, and it was a very brief image, but it was as if God was just showing me a glimpse of how beautiful his bride is, of how much he loves the church, and I was completely, kind of couldn't even speak about it. It was so beautiful what I could see. And I feel like the Lord at the moment in this season is wanting to, to purify us. We've been in a series on holiness. We've been in a series on prayer. And perhaps there's things that we might just want to let the Holy Spirit search our hearts for tonight. Areas where we've perhaps just grown a bit cold in how we think about the church. Or perhaps just decided to take a little step back, step back from being part of it. But this is a season to lean in. That God is doing so many beautiful things around our city at the moment. That he wants to draw each and every one of us deeper into his love and deeper into family.